this is Senate Finance, and today um, we are continue looking at the federal money that's available for broadband and what the state's plan is for going after it, um, what the need is, and Senator Pearson, you have your hand up. And I have to be on my iPad so I can't see everybody at once because my computer keeps losing internet connection. So I'm I back to iPads. Just a really quick question. Is there, you said the federal money available for broadband. Is there a special uh, money particularly for broadband or do we all believe that the, the COVID money is uh, applicable for broadband? Just a point I, of clarification before we get it's going. It's my understanding there is some money earmarked and Maria's shaking her head. Maria's gonna tell us what the money is and where it is, but I have Secretary French on, and Secretary, um, is it my understanding that you have time constraints? Yes, good afternoon. I do have a hard stop at two o'clock, but uh, other than that, I'm available. Okay, well then maybe we'll have Maria go first and tell us what, uh, what money is available, and then we'll go to Secretary French. My question for him is, um, what we asked and we've asked from the school, all the school associations, where, where are the real trouble spots? Where are we seeing, where could we get the biggest bang for the buck, um, you know, in, in the schools? Um, have we got schools that are not, you know, have a significant number of students in certain clustered areas that can't do broadband so i think that's our question there and maria floor is yours okay great maria royal with legislative council so i am going to hopefully share a document ah, okay good uh, did that come up can everybody see that so yeah faith can you make it a little bigger Maria, do you know how to do that? I don't. It's filling my screen. So there's a, there's a little plus and minus sign at the top of your screen. Usually there is. And Anne, it may be that you want to just rearrange where it the... may be me. Okay. Okay. I can I can get it up. All right. Is I've got it bigger. I have it on full screen right now, so I'm not sure. Yep. Maria, down at the bottom where it says 110, yep. you may be able to make that a little bigger for us. Okay. Okay. That's fine. That's... Thank you. Is that working? Yeah. Great. That's, yeah. Okay. So um, what this document is, is a summary of all of the various appropriations in the CARES Act that include money in one way or another for connectivity. Um, could be devices, could be broadband infrastructure. And we, there are many potential sources um, and obviously there are gonna be other draws on that money. So how much is ex exactly is gonna be available for broadband is kind of to be determined. But uh, the chair had asked that I kind of review what those streams are um, and then know what some of the deadlines are in terms of getting the money out. So you are aware of what your time frame is with respect to some of the money. And I also, the chair had said just a few minutes of an overview so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time, uh, but hopefully this document, it will be a good resource to kind of refer back to. A lot of these programs are in development right now, so I will strive to update it as new information becomes available and ask Faith that, to uh, repost it. So with all of that being said, um, and please uh, feel free to stop me at any point. Otherwise, I'll go through, I think, pretty quickly uh, to ensure that you have enough time uh, before two. 
So for example, and I've categorized the funding streams, the first category is rural and economic development. There was money to 100 million to an existing RUS program. That uh, deadline for that money has already passed. It was already um, in the works. This is just an influx of additional cash. Um, I believe VTEL has applied for some of this money. I wanted to include it here and we don't need to talk about it in detail because if there is a service funded through this program, that may impact what other federal funding is available to potentially serve those areas. Um, that's going to be an issue that will need to be track of. Okay. Okay. So then also uh, there was one point and all of these appropriations unless specified otherwise are national. So they go to the national uh, agency or right. department. And I did try to break down where we knew specifically uh, what the state share was. And I'll mention that, but but Maria, yes. can you just clarify, this is separate from the 1.25 billion, right? Yep, it is. This is all separate. I do have, um, I did include that in here. So you're aware of that money, but I understand that that's obviously not just for broadband or uh, that's uh, discretionary state money. We'll talk about that briefly, uh, but it is here just so you have the whole, the whole world of funding streams, at least in one document. So there's money to the Department of Commerce, Economic Development Assistance Programs, uh, $1.5 billion. Um, I did where I could. Uh, so you'll see in most of these um, appropriations, I included the actual language from the CARES Act uh, because that will be important, very important in some instances to make sure the money is allocated or expended consistent with the CARES Act. And then I also, in some instances, included uh, the actual statute, uh, some relevant language to the underlying programs that are going to be expending the money. And then I also have links throughout the document. So if you want to refer back to the program and look more specifically. Um, so those are kind of the, those are the two big uh, rural and economic development appropriations. In terms of telehealth, um, you're aware of the, I'm sorry, was there a question? Actually, I do have a question. Um, that last one, how is that different from the, the 1.25 billion that the state of Vermont is getting? Uh, when you say the last one, do you mean that? The e development assistance programs. The, the EDA? Uh, totally separate money. So this money is going to a federal program. It can be uh, given out in the form of grants uh, at the local level. If you look on, and I'm looking at where it says section 209 of the public works, mm -hmm. I just included a description there of what this particular money can be used for. Again, this is not the relief fund. Right. Um, so on the application of an L eligible recipient, the secretary may make grants for development of public facilities, public services, business development, uh, planning, technical assistance, training, any other assistance to alleviate long-term economic deterioration and sudden and severe economic dislocation. So my understanding, actually Clay Purvis was uh, very helpful in reminding me about this appropriation and also um, letting me know the history that this particular program has been used in the past for broadband construction. So okay. there is precedent. So to the extent that there are applicants in Vermont that apply for this money, they potentially could use that for broadband build out. Can the state apply? Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, I don't know if it's the state or if it's a municipality um, or other public local public entity, but I will absolutely. You know who probably could apply would be the CUDs. They are municipalities, right? They are municipalities and potentially they could apply. Yeah. So that might be something to send out to the CUDs. Yep. Is this what's what's broadband defined in the is it wasn't the first one 10 
one and the second one 25 three? Uh, when you say the first one, the first program that I have listed here? Yeah. Okay, so I think you're referring to the reconnect program. I, right, and so yeah. this is money in the form of grants, loans, grants and loans that go to areas that currently don't have 10-1 and uh, the recipients are required to build out broadband that is a minimum of 25.3. I mean, 25.3 on a good day, up to 25.3. That's the minimum. That's okay. That's a minimum. So we could go higher. Well, this is a federal program. Right, but I mean, we could. Yes, with whatever program. Uh, yeah create a new program, you could set uh, performance levels yeah. of whatever, whatever you think is appropriate. Yeah. The minimum is 25.3, no more 10.1. Correct, for the reconnect program. Okay. Which is consistent with the existing state uh, programs that you have, the connectivity initiative, mm -hmm. and the high cost program. They're all at a set the base of 25.3. Okay. So I know you're going to be running out of time really soon. Um, so I'm also happy to come back. Uh, yes, we are. Okay. Do you tell me if you'd like me to pause or if you want me to keep going? Okay, yeah, let's let you pause and we'll get to Secretary French. And um, then we'll go back. But Secretary, I think we're really looking for a progress update on uh, where, where are the schools seeing their biggest issues in broadband and. Yeah, good afternoon. I, um, I wasn't really sure about what the topic of today's testimony <laughs> was, was until I received the invitation this morning, um, but I'm happy to come back with specific information. I can say um, the issue what we see in, in COVID-19 isn't so much school broadband, it's community broadband. We have, yeah. uh, the issue now is the students are not in their schools. Um, so right. we do have schools that don't have sufficient access, but the issue now is now the students are in and teachers are out in the landscape. Um, how do we support uh, remote learning uh, when we're relying on uh, a different set of infrastructure than they would have available inside their school buildings? Um, I think I mentioned previously during the um, American Reinvestment Recovery Act in 2008-2009, School districts made a lot of progress in building out wide area networks, which is essentially sort of a hub and spoke configuration that many of our school districts in Vermont employ, meaning that there is a central location mm -hmm. in each supervisor union where a central pipe of internet comes in. And then the spokes or the, the wide area network connections are then farmed out to the individual buildings in the uh, supervisory union. We did a lot of that work uh, during the 2009 timeframe um, so most districts, I would say today, I feel pretty comfortable saying that have some sort of a wide area network. Um, but once again, the issue today is sort of the, the perennial issue in Vermont has always been this last mile. And now uh, we mm -hmm. see this playing out uh, considerably in that students and teachers are no longer within those networks. They're outside in the landscape trying to pull down resources. Um, I was going to just comment also on, I thought your topic was on federal money. I was going to give you a brief update on uh, the CARES Act and uh, education funding that's available under the CARES Act. Okay, yeah, that would be helpful. So there's two two pots of money uh, that are sort of dedicated to education. One is the elementary and secondary school um, emergency relief fund, which is the big pot of money. That's approximately $30 million to the state of Vermont. And then uh, the smaller pot is the governor's uh, emergency education relief fund and Vermont's allocation there is three, $3 million. So the um, last time I, I was here, uh, we didn't have a lot of specificity on either pot of money. Um, <clears throat> the, the large pot of money, the uh, ESSER fund uh, application went live last Friday and we submitted our application yesterday. Uh, the SEA, the state did, the Agency of Education. Um, the U.S. Department of Education has told us to expect about a three-day turnaround on that. So conceivably by the end of this week, we'll, we will have received approval 
um, of those funds. And what that means is then we would turn around and uh, allocate those funds to the local districts. Those funds, 90% uh, of those funds are allocated to school districts directly. And uh, they have fairly wide discretion how they use those funds as long as the funds are used in accordance with an existing federal education program um, and including technology and so forth. So conceivably school districts will have the ability to pay for broadband access, computers, uh, internet-based learning resources and so forth. Uh, but 90% of that $30 million is allocated directly to the LEAs. Now, they also have a lot of competing uh, interest in those funds as well. In particular, um, I've been messaging to them to focus on uh, social and emotional supports for students. I think we're going to have a lot of interest in uh, providing additional support services for students. As you know, we've been feeding students and doing a lot of other things during this time period. Um, but it's really hard at this point to assess the uh, social and emotional impact of this emergency on families and kids. And we expect to have considerable new expenses in that area. Uh, so I just, I just caution district to maintain some flexibility in addressing those needs. Uh, the second pot of money, which is the, the governor's uh, emergency education relief fund, I believe is $3 million. Um, the governor has expressed interest in working closely with the General Assembly and prioritizing how those funds are utilized. Um, that application should be going out soon. It's a pretty pro forma application essentially just requires assurances and so forth. Um, but those funds uh, are fairly, can be broadly utilized, largely once again, focused on COVID-19 response, um, can be utilized for um, a school district that has significant impact, can be used in higher education, it could be used more broadly for any other kind of educational entity uh, that's been felt the impact of COVID-19 and providing supports. So that's sort of an update on the funding. Um, back to the issue of uh, access, I think the access, my perception of what I've seen unfold so far, it's really the last mile issues. It's not so much the infrastructure right. inside of schools, it's how do we, how do we deal with parents? I had another parent email me this morning, you know, I'm in this, I'm in the town of Chelsea, can't seem to get online, but they also have cell coverage, you know, so it's, it's hard to figure those yes. things out. So we're literally down to those kind of family by family sort of issues. Well, I think that's what we're looking for. If we're going for a grant, we're going to need to say something a little more specific than broadband. I think we're going to need to say this area has got, you know, 20, 30, 40, whatever percent of their kids mm -hmm. can't access remote learning. And, you know, by extension, their parents can't get telehealth. So, um, you know, the more the focus... I think that's the schools are, are there dealing with it. I think they have probably the best firsthand information um, about just the percentage of their kids and the sections of their towns or their districts that are cut out so that we can figure out how to focus on that. And, you know, if you can just touch base with the principals or the superintendents and, and get that for us, then it will make putting things together that much better. Okay. Sure. Senator Pearson and. Thank, thank you. A couple questions for the secretary. Um, are you or the governor considering any of those funds that go directly to schools uh, to be uh, um, used for food as we get out of the school year? I, I know there's been a lot of concern that and, and your department agencies to be credited and our school partners across the state have done a great job handling school food and making that go way further than school lunch. So I appreciate that very much. But I am worried that this is all supposed to get cut off on June 18th or whatever. And so I'm curious if, um, if you've thought of that and then I'd, I'd love a second question if we have time. Yeah, we are actively working on that, Senator. Um, the immediate issue I'm working on right now is uh, the governor's asked me to produce guidance on end of year celebrations and um, graduations. Mm -hmm. So we uh, have a deadline to produce guidance of uh, May 8th on that. And that's sort of the beginning of the conversation about what does the rest of the summer look like? Uh, I was just mm -hmm. in a conversation with Dr. Levine uh, 
trying to, uh, as I have been pushing, pushing him to predict the future, you know, which is really difficult, but we're trying to play out that trajectory of, of the virus um, based on the sort of opening of the spigot and the implications for being able to use our school facilities for a wide range of activities, not just in-person instruction, the provisioning of meals uh, and so forth. So we're getting a better handle on that. Um, but I think the issue of summer activities is gonna be an important one, but we certainly okay. have as a priority being able to feed students through the summer. And um, that's essentially the, the authorization that allows us to do that now is essentially the summer authorization. Um, so we've effectively closed our schools but are still providing federally subsidized meals. We're allowed to do that under the federal law that speaks to the summer programming. So we, we consider it a priority um, and I know districts do as well. So yes, this funding, a lot of the CARES Act money starts to be spoken for lots of different ways pretty quickly. Uh, but a priority that will remain is, is making sure students don't experience food insecurity. Okay, uh, Senator Pearson, did you have another question? Uh, yeah, but I don't want to hog, we've only got a few minutes with the secretary, so. Okay, Senator Ballant, did you have a question? No, okay, just saw a motion, anybody else? Yeah. Okay, uh, Senator Pearson, well, I got Senator McDonald, and then I'll go back to Senator Pearson. Where in the federal grants mm -hmm. is money specifically available for last mile build out? In the two pots of money I refer to, it's not referenced at all. Uh, in the, the larger pot of money that goes to districts, there is a, a, a sort of allowable use uh, dedicated to technology, but it doesn't talk specifically about school districts building out last mile infrastructure. School districts could pay for bandwidth for the provisioning of services inside their district, but it doesn't speak any more specifically. Yeah, yeah I don't think that's really the pot of money we're looking at to, <clears throat> to do actual build out. Okay, Senator Pearson. My, my question is, I guess, similar. I, I've been wondering if, if it's too soon, but if you've had any thoughts of uh, the fall. I, I'm, I'm sort of picturing, you know, the, a lot of people say we'll go into these constrict and, and relax time. So October 15th, we get some flare ups, we send kids home. At that point, when we still have kids that are totally unable to be learning remotely, that begins to be more on us, as I <coughs> mean broadly. I, I, I'm not pointing fingers at the agency, but are, is there planning underway for those moments? I, you know, maybe it means we identify a few towns where there's no high-speed internet and we drop lines there. You know, I mean, I'm just trying to think about what's the next wave and, and we won't be able to answer all of that, but can we be aiming to be 75% of the way there by October 1st or whatever? Yeah, I think, you know, a lot of uh, the conversation we've had with our partners in state government is about around sort of the near term solutions, like literally how do we go down this road or how do we reach this family? And that's that's going to be a, a priority. I think the point on remote learning, though, is that districts have flexibility to deliver remote learning lots of different ways and not all of that requires technologies. We've seen schools. Right you know, hand delivering things, I don't say hand delivering, but, you know, delivering materials to students' houses. There's lots of other options available. And I think, you know, in those moments where we are able to utilize our facilities better, um, you know, we'll, we'll have to enact uh, those supports for students more emphatically. But yeah, I think the near term, near term issues are very much on everyone's mind. And uh, as I mentioned, those, those calls come in fairly regularly um, about individuals. And sometimes it's just educating people about how to use their technology they have. So when someone calls in and says, I don't have broadband, but then we find out they have really good cell coverage and we're helping that, you know, in some cases I've heard of schools helping a parent use their cell phone as a hotspot so the student could use the Chromebook, you know, and Verizon, Comcast or other providers have been very uh, supportive of getting, making sure those families have access. So there's, there's a lot of different issues out there. I hear from schools that say, uh, yeah, I have broadband, but what are they going to talk about even better broadband? Because my broadband isn't really that great, you know? So right. um, you, you'll hear the, I'm sure you've heard all of that before, but whatever I can do to help. And I know the other agencies are, are very supportive as well. But. Okay. Because I think we can admit that broadband is probably the best way. Um, 
picking up homework or going to a hot spot and downloading it and uploading it is not the same as face-to-face -face with your teacher or meetups with your classmates. Um, yeah, and it's the perennial issue of technology and education is like one thing leads to the other. So right. it's not sufficient to say we'll have all the bandwidth and then figure out what to do with it. In many cases right now, we're figuring out what to do with it, but then exposing places that don't have sufficient access. But one helps right. drive the other. Um, and I think particularly I'll just reference the point about the social emotional supports. We're investigating using the technology to deploy social and emotional supports to students, just like telemedicine is being supported. Right. So increasingly our de designated service agencies and other providers will be relying on the infrastructure to reach out to families that have, have not been as well connected. Right. I know that there is concern about students who have kind of disappeared for the last right. two and a half months. Um, I know we've got some mental health workers who are actually delivering meals so they can just kind of be there and have a yeah. door cell discussion. So I think what we're saying is if there's federal money available, um, we would really be negligent if we didn't do everything we could to be prepared for the next time. And the next time might be something very different, but um, you know, that, that I think this is pointed out that there's two Vermonts, the ones that can get connected and the ones that can't. So um, that's where we're trying to go, if, especially since there seem to be resources available. So, and please don't discount this summer. Um, I thought Senator Ballant might be going to speak to that, but I know I have a family member who says, well, he's not sure his layoff isn't going to be permanent, but he's not going to look because all the day camps and the whole thing yes. that they kind of sausage together for their kids for the summer probably aren't going to be open and somebody's going to have to be home with the kids. And these are school age kids who don't have regular daycare. So daycare yeah. isn't, it's the rec department, it's the pool, it's the rec department day camp, and they probably aren't going to be open and it'll be an issue. Yeah, we're yeah. working on that. We're hopeful that we can Good. have that infrastructure up, but we're, it's a priority right now for us to start working on. Good, because I think that would relieve some parents' minds. Um, yeah, we've got a lot of anxious parents out there yeah. who are already at their wit's end and are just not sure how they're going to face the summer. Right. So, and we've already got parents that are going back to work and there is no school and there is no childcare. Um, and so there are kids. Okay, thank you. I hope we got you out on time. And we're going to go back to Maria. And you can walk us through, and then we'll go to Commissioner Tierney and Clay. Okay. There comes Maria's. All right. All right. Can everybody see that? Yes. Okay. So just to, I, I think I kind of roughed into this a little bit quickly, but just so you understand how this is organized uh, before we go any further, I divided the special appropriations in the CARES Act by subject matter. So we talked about the rural and economic development related appropriations. We're about to talk about the telehealth appropriations that encompass some form of connectivity. Then we'll talk about the education uh, appropriations, um, then digital literacy, and then a review of the uh, coronavirus relief fund, uh, the big pot of money. And then uh, finally, it will conclude with just looking at some pre-existing federal funds for broadband in unserved and underserved areas because those are large pots of money available to the state uh, this year. Um, so trying to orchestrate and think about what money you go after and for what areas um, just is. So you have all of the possible funding streams in mind. So I hope that um, is helpful so you uh, can understand how I approach things here. And like I said, some of these programs are uh, in the works. This 
Next program, the, the telehealth program, the COVID-19 telehealth program, this program was in the works by the FCC before the CARES Act was passed. Um, so the CARES Act was passed March 27th. The FCC actually issued a report and order on April 2nd. Um, and the FCC is taking uh, reviewing and accepting applications right now. Um, I'm mentioning that because the money is available on a rolling basis for as long as, uh, until it has all been expended or the pandemic has ended, uh, whichever occurs first. Um, and to date, uh, there have been 17 awards to various healthcare providers nationally um, in 10 states for a total of 9.5 million in funding. Uh, so that's just to give an indication that this money is going out and is available right now to eligible healthcare providers. Um, in terms of you know, the other question that uh, is coming up, you know, is this last mile can it be used for last mile connectivity? I've included here a link to the FCC's guidance and then I actually put their language here where it describes what services and devices are covered. Um, you'll see that first bullet, uh, funding for telecommunications services and broadband connectivity services. Um, including voice services and internet connectivity services for healthcare providers or their patients. This is about as specific as it gets um, in terms of whether it would actually fund a service drop, a, say, uh, you know, fiber connection uh, from a line that runs by a patient's house, or whether it would actually fund building out for specific pain, uh, pa uh, patients if it uh, became apparent that there was a need. It's not clear to me that this money cannot be used for that. Um, the application, a description of the programs is uh, in somewhat narrative form. So I think if a provider could make an argument that particular patients and where they're located, uh, their health outcomes and the cost savings would be dramatic if they had fiber, I think you can make that argument. I don't know if that would be approved, and I have not had a chance to review the applications that have been approved to see what levels of connectivity have already been approved. But I, I guess it's a long way of saying uh, it's not clear that you cannot spend the money for actual last mile connectivity. Um, and I wouldn't want to discourage a provider from seeking that funding uh, if it felt like that would be important to serve its population. So this would have to come like from a VNA and then they would have to have a contract with a provider to run the line yep. up and it would probably, if you had three people in the same loop or 10 people in the same loop, it would probably be, have a better chance of Passage. Well, I think that's right. I mean, there's limited money um, available, right. 200 million nationally. So, and the FCC has said that they're going to cap the award at about a million dollars so that there's, you know, okay. enough to go around. Um, so, obviously, it it's going to depend on what the cost is for building out if, if you felt like you could make the case that in a particular instance, this would be a good use of money. Um, for healthcare reasons. So I will continue to look into this issue and see if I can find greater certainty about exactly what the money can be used for. But again, these applications are being accepted on a rolling basis and uh, uh, the money will run out eventually. Okay. Uh, the other program, whoops. Sorry, just trying to get used to this paging up and page you down. Um, there's another program that I've included here. It was created by the FCC as well, called the Connected Care Pilot Program. This program became effective um, 
earlier this month. It does not get an appropriation under the CARES Act. Rather, the FCC has reallocated its existing money under the Universal Service Fund. I wanted to include it here because it's a program to the extent that entities are looking for money to help cover some of their telehealth and connectivity services. This is a potential source of funding. It's a pilot program. Uh, providers uh, can apply to participate in this program. It's a three-year program. Uh, the amount of money that's going to go for the whole program over that three-year period is $100 million. I don't know how many, I can't recall if I knew actually how many pilots they're going to fund. But the idea is to see to what extent the FC3, FCC through its Universal Ser Service Fund um, should dedicate more funding towards telehealth, towards connectivity, uh, because of the potential cost savings and uh, good health outcomes for certain patient populations. So I, I wanted to uh, make sure you are aware of that program. Uh, Maria, yeah. could, I'm, uh, I'm hearing those as two different programs that seem to do just the same thing. So can you, uh, is there a distinction that I'm not picking up on or? There, there are two different programs. The uh, COVID-19 telehealth program, that money's going out right now immediately. It's one-time appropriations uh, to deal with um, the strains on the healthcare system um, and particularly uh, the need to uh, provide healthcare to people at this time who are in their homes who potentially should not be going to a hospital or to their doctor's offices uh, because of the risk of potentially uh, catching the virus. So that those are one-time funds. They range so far, I've seen uh, awards as low as $100,000. And again, as I mentioned earlier, up to a million dollars. So this is not part of the broad, the broad three-year program that where the FCC is really gonna look to collect the data to show um, services, telehealth services are actually improving patient outcomes or they're saving dollars. You know, that's a, a study that was and uh, a program that was in the works before the pandemic. Um, it's obviously taken on greater importance. But again, that's a three year pilot program, uh, which will involve a lot of data collection and review of results on very specific terms. Is that helpful? Thank you. Yeah, I think so. Okay. And Senator I do have, McDonald, do you have, no, okay, go ahead. Um, let's see. And for that pilot program, I just included uh, the dates here so that uh, interested providers were aware uh, that that application deadline may be coming up as soon as July 31st. Um, so just keep that in mind. Then um, this particular, the next appropriation here, the $27 billion to the Department of Health and Human Services. This is money that's going into the existing public health and social services emergency fund. I've included on that right-hand column, just the introductory language that was in the CARES Act related specifically to this appropriation. It is lengthy, and a lot of that money is going to be going towards vaccine research and development. Um, and it's not clear to me how it's going to be allocated. However, you can see that I've underlined that some of that money is av available for telehealth access and infrastructure. Um, I don't know enough about the specifics, uh, but I wanted you to be aware of that, and I will continue to try to track down additional information about how that money might be accessed uh, by in Vermont. Then uh, in addition, there is another uh, $180 million that goes to the Department of Health and Human Services. This goes to uh, uh, 
a specific fund. I think it's part of the Public Health and Social Services Emergency Fund. Uh, but this is the Health Resources and Services Administration, uh, HRSA, Rural Health Program. These are existing programs um, that are now getting an additional influx of money to continue offering grants uh, as they have been in the past. I have not had a time had the time to confirm uh, whether you know again this this question about last mile connections whether they are covered. Um, I am going to continue to look into that matter. Uh, there are just a lot of regulations uh, and relevant definitions, and it's just taking a little more time than I had to prepare. Okay, for yeah, this is a lot. Um, there are, let's see, uh, so for example, under the telehealth network and telehealth resource centers grant programs, this is at the bottom of the screen, if we're looking at the same screen, uh, this provides grants to support telecommunications technologies, which are defined in federal laws, technologies relating to the use of electronic information and telecommunications technologies to support and promote at a distance healthcare, patient professional health related education, health administration, and public health. So the language in the code is pretty general. Um, so I need to just look further in the regulations to find out uh, okay. more specifically. And that can be said for all of these programs listed here. Um, then, so more in the area of telehealth right now. These are all telehealth. Um, everything okay. that I'm talking about now is telehealth. Um, there's money, $2.15 billion has been appropriated to the Department of Veterans Affairs um, for their IT systems uh, and to ensure that they have services available to provide telehealth to veterans. There is also authority and I believe under that program, that includes a subsidy for broadband subscriptions. Uh, I believe that that is covered uh, for certain. Then the question is, will it pay for the building out of lines or service drop? Um, I realize that's a very significant issue. Um, there's also authority for the this isn't an appropriation, but this is uh, just for your awareness that the secretary can enter into short-term agreements with communications providers to provide subsidized uh, broadband services to veterans uh, for purposes of telehealth. Um, there is no specific appropriation uh, attached to those contracts. Um, but there are more general appropriations to the VA that um, might be able to be used to fund these subsidized subscriptions. Okay. Okay. So there's a whole, okay. There's more. <laughs> yeah, there's a whole bunch. And I can, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll go a little bit more quickly and we can come back to this. Yeah, I, it's on the website. So okay. any okay. of us that want to, print it and then sit down and work on it that this would it okay. would be helpful too all right so this next one the uh uh usda's distance learning and telemedicine program um 25 million dollars as the name suggests this is for educational remote learning and for telemedicine what i will say about this is the application deadline is july July 13th. Um, so again, I'm just trying to highlight. Um, we'll have to get on it. Institutions that want to apply, uh, they might want to keep that deadline in mind. And I've included all the, the regulations and announcements um, that describe the programs. There was one thing that I noticed that USDA um, 
what they had on their website that I thought was interesting in relation to connectivity, uh, which is a statement you see italicized and underlined there. While the CARES Act requires these funds to be used to prevent, prepare for, and respond to coronavirus, the agency believes that all ELT projects, this is a, in a pre-existing program, already serve that purpose. And I think that's underscoring that everything related to getting people who are at home connected right now is in response right. to the coronavirus. Having said that, to the extent you can further specify needs based on the funding source, telehealth patients, students, um, Maria, you know, may I ask a quick question, Madam Chair? Yes. So uh, I'm just wondering, is are the funds for, are the education funds specific for pre-K through 12 or can our higher ed institutions, state colleges use those as well for the uh, tele-education? So for this particular program, and we'll get to the other education funds that the secretary spoke about, mm -hmm. for this program, um, the eligible applicants include the way they're listed, um, most state and local government entities, federally recognized tribes, nonprofits, for-profit businesses, or consortia of eligible entities. So I don't see a restriction um, on K through 12. Okay. Okay, so I, it's, it's a pretty broad uh, category of eligible entities. Does that, Madam Chair? Yes. Does the state have an office of public school and state college education, telemedicine, and veterans services? Because if it did, it would be the only agency that could apply for this stuff if you wanted to put it into last mile broadband. Well, if you could do a consortium, though, where in this area for last mile, you had three veterans. 10 school kids and a bunch of sick elderly people, you could probably write a consortium grant of VNAs, school districts, and the veterans. Or you could have your CUDs, if they are in a position, write the grant. So uh, this is what the grants are. Then we'll have the commissioner talk to us about what they're looking at, what they're thinking about going for. Okay. And I'll just mention that for this program in particular, the existing distance learning and telemedicine program mm -hmm. grant may be used for uh, capital assets such as broadband transmission facilities. Okay. So then uh, we move on to education. Uh, so the DLT program I just spoke about is both telemedicine and education. So I won't repeat that here. Um, but then we talk about the money specifically to the funds that the secretary just spoke about. And I, so to the federal US Department of Education, there's an appropriation of approximately $30 billion of that amount, and this is just based on numbers that I got from the Joint Fiscal Office. Uh, so uh, to the extent there are any changes, um, you know, I'll make sure I try to keep track of those. But of that amount, approximately $58 million will be coming to Vermont. Uh, so the Secretary has already went, uh, kind of reviewed these. Um, I think he said 3 million in the Governor's Emergency Education Relief Fund. Yeah. I think uh, the JFO at 4.5 million, so we'll just make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, but these funds can be used to support uh, the transition to remote learning, um, which may involve uh, connecting students at home. Uh, and that could include uh, remote, you know, hotspot devices and potentially. Uh, broadband connections. I don't think it's clear that they would be excluded, um, similar to the other programs. So that's being looked at. It's um, really going to depend on how comprehensively we write a grant. Well, you're going to, these are all different funding streams. Right. So the decider is going to be various, uh, depending on what money you're 
applying for, different federal entities are going to be approving for their kind of particular programs. So it may be a matter of the, you know, eligible entities coordinating, you know, what money they're going to go after in a particular area, for example. Okay. So I think that's where a lot of the organizing might be. Um, and there may be overlap, obviously, um, with, you know, some of the populations in the uh, households most in need. Um, so I won't go through these in detail, but the, um, I'll just add that in addition to the two funds that the secretary talked about, there's also a higher education emergency relief fund and Vermont's share is about $22 million. These funds may be used for, this is according to the CARES Act language, technology costs associated with the transition to distance education uh, and grants to students to cover some of their technology needs. Pretty broad language, I understand that. Um, but just want to uh, at least have all of this information in one place and it will be updated. It's overwhelming, but it's helpful. It is a little bit overwhelming. <laughs> um, I, I realize that. Uh, so in terms of digital literacy, uh, what that has to do with is um, you know, teaching people how to uh, use uh, their internet connections if they're available, making sure that they're able to take advantage of online resources. Uh, there's a $50 million appropriation to the Institute of Museum and Library Services. And uh, I believe uh, based on the April 13th announcement by the IMLS, the first $30 million is going to be allocated to states based on population. And it looks like, based on their website, what they've published, Vermont's share is estimated to be about $56,000. Uh, but that announcement is also linked here. Uh, get additional details. So that's it for the special appropriations in the CARES Act. Then the um, Coronavirus Relief Fund. This is the $1.25 billion coming to, or maybe it's all came already, I, I've lost track, uh, to the state of Vermont. Uh, you're aware of the three conditions that were spelled out in this federal law. These, the eligible expenses includes, include those that are necessary expenditures incurred due to COVID-19. They were not accounted for in the budget most recently approved as of March 27th. And they must be incurred uh, this year, starting from looking uh, back till March 1st. The Department of Treasury has issued a guidance, um, which I have linked here, which gives a little more clarification. Um, on what the money can be used for. Again, this is not obviously all for connectivity, but to the extent you want it to use it for broadband, I think that certainly would meet the conditions under the federal law. And I don't see anything in the guidance uh, that suggests that that money would not be available for broadband. I think the issue that I am trying to monitor and keep track of is the incurred provision to the extent you did want to make monetary awards or grants for build out, um, structuring them in a way so that the money goes out uh, by the end of the year. That can be a little bit tricky. Uh, in general, you know, grants are awarded based on performance metrics. It doesn't all go out at the, you know, once the contract is signed, but over a period of time, and so in terms of what it means to be incurred, um, the guidance basically says the money is expended. Um, so I think the question there is, would it be one of the options that I've been thinking about and want to do a little more research on is, for example, could the department set up a program and maybe hold the money in escrow so that it's no longer with the state and it's to be um, 
uh, appropriated um, in installments based on a performance contract, um, whether that would meet the guidelines for expenditures under this particular fund. And that's, that's just so you know, that's something that I'm looking at uh, just to be ready for in the event that you do want to try to use some of this money for deployment, which may not happen, obviously. Uh, maybe there are deployment measures that can happen this year. So in that case, you're all set. Okay. So just a couple more things I'm going to add. Uh, I'm not, I don't have to go through these again. I'm, I'm realizing now it's getting very late, but for your awareness, uh, the NTIA through their Broadband USA um, office has compiled a guide to all federal broadband funding programs. There are about 57 broadband programs right now that span 14 federal agencies. Um, you, this is an excellent database because you can search based on broadband infrastructure grants, um, digital literacy. Uh, you, it's very specific um, in terms of what you want the money for. And it's also, if you're looking money through particular federal agencies or uh, eligible uh, entities that might apply. So it's a great resource. It does not include the CARES Act programs and some of the more recent federal programs, uh, but I thought it's helpful uh, that that information is out there. The last two programs I'm gonna to touch on pretty briefly, um, but these are the FCC programs that predated the CARES Act, but are new programs. One is the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund. Um, this will go out to rural areas uh, in phases. The first phase, the money is scheduled, the auction, it's a reverse auction. The, that auction is scheduled to commence in October of this year and up to $16 billion will be available through that program. Uh, the next phase, I don't, there isn't a deadline yet. Uh, that will, I think, depend on the first phase, um, but that smaller amount of money will be available to cover areas that were not served under phase one. There are a number of issues to consider here about this, these dollars, and um, I'm sure you'll probably wanna go into more detail uh, at a later date, um, but I just wanted to have that information there. Similarly, there is an another FCC program for mobile service, and that's the 5G Fund for Rural America. And that is uh, scheduled to distribute up to $9 billion. This is still in a rulemaking phase, so it's not clear yet when that money um, will be auctioned. Okay. And that's a lot of information. Uh, but that concludes what I was prepared to walk through today. Wow. That's even more detailed than the health and welfare one. So thank you. That's a lot of information. And I have to and say, Clay Purvis was wonderfully helpful um, and has been available at all hours of the day and night to answer random questions that I have because there's a lot of complexity and history here. And uh, I've benefited yeah. from that, I have to say. Okay. Thank you. Questions for Maria at this point. Senator Pearson. I think um, got... Maria, and, and actually, Madam Chair, you may have some insight into this. A lot of these programs, maybe the state can play a role. I'm glad you're looking into what some creative ways we could do that. But it also strikes me that a lot of our partners, uh, you mentioned the VNA, Madam Chair, um, could potentially take advantage of that. And there are tight deadlines. So it could be that the state ends up just trying to alert people to it, maybe playing a coordinating role. Are we aware that our partners in the home health and elsewhere um, are looking into this? I mean, are they even aware of these options? Do, do we have any way to know that they're engaged uh, on this front? We took testimony in health and welfare. We had Maria, but um, I don't know what the chair is 
you know, if she's planning to go forward with it, but uh, to this point, I don't know of anything. Maybe the department does. I think most of the healthcare agencies at this point are busy. Um, so it would probably have to predate this, you know, the, the present emergency. But as we're coming out of it, it's a good time to start talking to them about uh, working together, perhaps, to, you know, we could be of assistance to help them write the grant because they may not have the in-house expertise to do it. And it sounds like a lot of these would be better off if we put in kind of a joint grant. I mean, but we'll find out if we can be part of it. Okay, do we have other questions for Maria? I've got you all on one screen. Okay, if not, we're gonna to go to Commissioner Tierney. And Commissioner, I've asked you to kind of talk to us about where the state is in, you know, what your thinking is, what your planning is, not for the 10 year plan, because I think we understand that that's money in the budget and who knows what's gonna survive in the budget. But shorter range, these kinds of emergency, how do we deal with the present crisis and the possibility probability that at least next year we may see some shorter term or even longer term similar kinds of stay home issues um, that will require connectivity. So I turn it over to you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I trust that the members all have the handouts that the department prepared and sent over, one uh, of which is a one pager. That they are up on the website. If There's a one page uh, document we there that outlines uh, what I plan to cover. Okay. And you'll see immediately looking at it that I view this as a three phase operation that has three windows, which I mentioned on April 4 and April 9. Today, I'm pleased to give you some details about the planning that we've been doing that I mentioned we were doing in my April 10 testimony to you, and that we also touched on in April 21. So good progress is being made. There is a lot to do. And as you could hear from the excellent overview that Maria just gave, there are lots of funding resources out there, but this is not a situation where you have one access in and one authority that can grant a bunch of money to you. There are lots of little approaches and many different federal agencies that have a hand in granting money in addition to the funds that have been sent to the state. So this is a huge coordination exercise and the department is undertaking work in that area, which you'll see in this briefing. And the first item, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but I do want to make the point to the committee that the immediate actions the department have been taking, has been taking are not intended to be permanent fixes. They're not um, in any way considered uh, optimal, but they are something. And when you have nothing, something is, is pretty good. So we've been rolling out these hotspots that people can use in parking lots of schools, for instance. We've gotten um, a lot of very positive feedback from the public on this. We've heard from a school superintendent who characterized this literally up in the Champlain Islands as a game changer and an equalizer for the kids in his district. Basically what we did is put out a map, as you know, it has 733 sites on it. It's had over 18,000 views since it was published, an average of 537 views per day. Alone on the Vermont Emergency Management social media, it's had 644 shares. So this map and the word about the hotspots is getting out there. Folks are engaged on it and helping us to update this map as well. And we will continue doing this work. We were able to successfully coordinate a donation from Microsoft and RTO Wireless to get 35 hotspots up and running. This was cost-free to the state and to Vermonters. Uh, of those uh, 35, we already have 20 up and running and another 15 to go. 10 of those are gonna go up this week. In addition, Belco is also looking at its infrastructure to see whether they can put any hotspots online. Also, there are a variety of providers who have made their hotspots like um, Comcast, for instance, available for free to the public. 
Uh, in addition to the hotspots and the web page that the department has put up and is maintaining um, consistently every time new offerings and new discounts uh, are published from a variety of internet service providers, uh, or if in the electric space, uh, the electric utilities are trying to do something, that information goes on, excuse me, goes on our web page. We also are looking into what we can do with FEMA funding in order to arrange for emergency communications aid. And the reason I'm pursuing this is because like you, Madam Chair, I don't see this just as a, we get out of this particular uh, stay home, stay safe period. I'm anticipating the possibility, I don't have knowledge, but from a planning perspective, I have to anticipate the possibility that there will be flare ups, the possibility that we will not be able to return to normal, so to speak, if there is such a thing until a vaccine is issued, which means that we may be looking at a planning window of 18 months. And so I'm trying to see whether there is FEMA funding available to deploy temporary communications wireless though they may be, to provide broadband, recognizing that that is not the superior way perhaps to provide broadband, at least not with available technology right now, but it is a way to get to people. A sampling of technology, for instance, would be to deploy cell on wheel vehicles, such as was done in the aftermath of Irene. Problem there is there aren't a lot of those available. So, but we are continuing to look into this area. We are also coordinating with regional planning commissions and CUDs and many state agencies in order to come up with the optimal way to deploy these kinds of communications should we be fortunate enough to be able to get them and funding for them. Transitioning to phase two, which is approaching more quickly than I'd like, but it's the reality of what we're dealing with. As you can see, item one is cross-coordination with a variety of stakeholders. I have specified CARES Act funding here because that's what we're trying to get our arms around right now. As you can see from the presentation with Maria, it is a rather complicated area. And the two focuses in our cross-coordination are education and telehealth. Uh, in point of fact to your conversation of a moment ago, the department is reaching out to uh, the Department of Health in order to see what kind of help they need, what kind of support they need and to also ensure that uh, providers are aware of the variety of grants and funding opportunities that are available in this very short period of time. That effort's not complete, but it is underway. Uh, related to it is the next item here, which is our survey project, because at the foundation of all of our planning activities is that we need to know who we're trying to reach. As you can see from listening to uh, Secretary French's testimony, um, sometimes folks will contact their schools, sometimes they will contact the directors, sometimes they'll they will contact the secretary, sometimes they, they contact my CAPI division and they tell us we don't have broadband. Sometimes it turns out that that person in fact does not have fiber or cable broadband service, but maybe a cell option is there that they didn't know about. There's coordination that has to go on and we do our best to do that coordinating with those individual cases. But what it highlights is that we don't have a good repository of reliable information about how many people are in this situation, what their specific technology needs are, whether it's an infrastructure issue such as last mile, or whether it's a technology issue such as not having a device, or whether it's a, a, an affordability issue as in they can't pay for a subscription or they didn't know that there, there was an offering in their area or for whatever reason, until this point in time, they didn't want to have such a service in their home or such, te such technology in their home. So that's a, a surveying effort that is underway. I very much appreciated your asking the Secretary of Education to check in with the superintendents and the schools, because I think if this, this is the, the one time or one of the very few times I can think of where frankly, you can't have too many cooks in the kitchen. And this is a perfect example of how the legislature could be enormously helpful because all of you are elected officials have constituents. And so if you have a means of reaching out to your constituents and say, hey, do you need a connectivity solution? Do you have a student at home who doesn't have a connectivity solution for remote learning? Do you have somebody at home who has a medical condition who's in need of remote telemedicine you know, please contact the department. And so you folks could help us find these people. As you pointed out, Madam Chair, knowing how many people we have and where they are would be a very important fact for any grant writing that is done 
um, if, if we're going to apply for a variety of the resources that, um, that Maria has enumerated so far. So I would very much ask your help on that point. Um, the next item on the short-term action list is the utility call to action, with which I think you are familiar. I recall sending an email out. I just don't recall whether it went to all of the membership of your committee, but that is the email in which I stated very clearly to the utilities that are under the regulatory jurisdiction of the PUC and the department, and also the utilities that are working in this state, but that are not providing a regulated service, I've asked them there to do what they can to get connectivity solutions deployed, whether it's working together to do that or to accelerate projects that they already have in their pipeline and the like. I have told them to keep track of their costs because it still is not completely clear how we could reimburse them. But if we don't have the information, we couldn't even begin to do that. And as you can see from the overview that you got from Maria, uh, we have only very recently learned what the language means, at least under the 1.25 billion that has been allocated to Vermont, which is that those expenditures, as I understand it, have to be made, the money has to be out the door by December 30th, 2020, end of this year. So that's a very short fuse, and that's why I put that call to action out. Uh, going to the next um, uh, item, we have a, at least as far as I recall, a three-year grant track record with the Connectivity Fund Consistently, our bid, our, our, our funds were oversubscribed by bids, which means that there are a variety of bids that did not get funding through our program. They had to have been sufficiently engineered when they were made such that we could assess whether or not to give the funding. So one of the projects that we have underway is a review of those bids that did not receive any funding to see whether they could be revived. They would be shovel-ready projects. I see that uh, I've misspelled that to shove-ready, but that happens. Uh, anyway, those are shovel-ready projects that we're looking to, um, to inventory. We also know that there are a variety of per, per, excuse me, providers that have um, line extension projects in the works. For instance, Comcast um, is required to build out over 300 miles of line as a result of a settlement last year that the department brokered. They've completed roughly half of that so far. And if there is a way for us to help them get fast track permitting and to move through that process so that they can get those lines built, the department is going to do that. That is part of the guidance that I gave on April 10. In response to that call to action and, and, and the like, we have heard from uh, Charter and Comcast who are arranging meetings with us to discuss what they could be doing. We have also heard from Franklin Telephone, which on its own initiative was out there building fiber and, excuse me, uh, lines in, in its community and also put up a hotspot of its own accords. So they, they anticipated the needs that, um, that I went public with on April 10. We've also heard from Velco and from Verizon and VTEL and Vermont Gas. And I know other utilities are working as well to see how they can be responsive to that call to action. I don't have the specifics yet because as you can imagine, there's a fair amount of planning work, budgeting work, board of directors work that those entities have to do before they can commit to something. But you should know that that work is underway. And frankly, that is one of the, the, the best prospects we have if we can get money from the, um, the COVID-19 relief money in order to get uh, connectivity built before the end of the year. Um, what we then finally have is the emergency broadband plan update. Um, I have a few bullets here that describe what that's about. We also gave you a handout that more specifically outlines what the department is shaping up and its thinking. We've also done some plans, I mean, excuse me, some map work. Uh, and I think there's one or maybe two maps that we have provided to you. And I'm going to ask Clay to speak to that. But before I go to Clay to discuss the emergency broadband plan, I'd also just like to point out that phase three is the more long-term plan. And what I envision there is that there will be a mechanism um, much in the nature of uh, what the state did during ARA, where if there isn't an office of recovery that's set up um, on the fifth floor as was back then, there will be another group. Um, it may well be, um, the, the group that has been con, um, convened under the leadership of Secretary Curley right now um, in order to pull together a federal grant approach or a, a pitch through our federal delegation and through you to get federal funding should there be an additional 
um, stimulus bill or infrastructure bill coming out of Washington, D.C. And if there were to be such a funding source available, uh, the broadband plan that Clay is about to brief you on would be one centerpiece of a grant or a, a funding proposal that the state advances. I have to emphasize how important it would be for um, my agency at that point to be working with you and to be working with the federal delegation so that we are approaching um, the federal government as a unified voice. With that, I'm going to ask Clay to give the briefing on the emergency broadband plan update. Okay, maybe we can stop here and say, are there any questions for the commissioner at this point? And you'll have to just say, I at this because I can't all see right. anything. All right. All right. Well, I think good. if I got Senator Brock and Senator, I've got Senator McDonald has popped up. Did I hear hey. Senator Brock? Okay, Senator McDonald. When uh, when Comcast was obliged to to um, to build out a certain number of miles as a um, because they had failed to do something else, um, what was the minimum? A requirement for broadband that they had to build out. Clay, unless you know the answer to that, we're going to have to get back to you on that, Senator. I'm pretty sure it does. Uh, which build out obligation are you referring to? Any build out obligation where the cable companies are obliged to build more lines out into the countryside, what standard are they obliged to build? Or, or are we putting diabetics? as a punishment working on a chocolate factory assembly line. So. All right, you lost me on that one, Senator. Madam Chair, the cable company I, I don't want to build anywhere. I understand the question about the, the, yeah. the speed. Yes. Okay, that, that I understand. The chocolate and the diabetics you lost me at. Um, Commissioner, Generally, you know, or, or Clay? The, uh, the build out obligations that cable companies um, build out under usually uh, through their cable video CPG. So we're building out cable video plan. Um, cable video systems using DOCSIS 3.1, which is the, the cable standard um, in play today. Um, they can provide download speeds of up to a gig, theoretically, uh, in general practice, the download speeds are um, about 150 megabits per second. The upload, they're asymmetrical, so the upload is usually lower, um, the consumer can 30. Can't be 40, lower and be symmetrical. Asymmetrical, so 30 or 40 megs, but it's, uh, the, the service offerings provided by Comcast and Charter, usually well above the 25.3 federal definition. Okay. In, in other words, it, they offer very good service. If it's, even though it's not fiber, it's still a very good and usable service. Okay. So any other questions for the commissioner? Okay, Clay, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, may I ask at the outset just how much time I have so I don't... Uh, you ask me. On. It is three o'clock, so I guess I will have to ask Faith to let, if she hasn't already, let Abby know we're running late. Uh, we've only got one more witness after you, and that's uh, probably going to be a 10-15 minute, just some answers to questions. So I'd say you've got up to a, you know, 15 minutes half hour, okay. 15 would be better. Let, let me share my screen. Need to, all right, so um, <clears throat> in light of the COVID-19 emergency, we've undertaken uh, development of a uh, broadband deployment plan uh, tailored to respond to the COVID-19 emergency. Um, we would like to publish this plan um, for public comment on Tuesday, May 5th. Just as a, a general overview, um, we're hoping to, we will be proposing to you concrete executable measures that the state could implement if funding's available to provide universal service. So we're starting with the premise that 
um, this is how much money it will take to provide universal service. So not a plan that proposes to work with what we have, but tell you what you need um, to get everyone broadband. Okay. Um, here's a key or a list of key recommendations. The, the number one is recommendation is to create a subsidy program that would provide 100 megabits per second symmetrical service to all addresses that currently lack 25 through today. Um, we're identifying the need for uh, somewhere between 85 million to 293 million. That'll depend on several questions, what decisions you make about um, uh, how the program should run. Um, we're proposing a reverse auction, much in the same vein as the FCC's um, uh, Rural Digital Opportunity Fund. Um, we're proposing that it complements the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund so that we wouldn't be subsidizing the same locations that the FCC is proposing to subsidize. Um, so as in a reverse auction, we would start with um, a reserve pricing. Um, Earlier this year, or excuse me, at the end of last year, we submitted to you a report on the feasibility of electric utilities providing broadband service. That report discusses in detail the costs associated with um, providing uh, fiber to the premises. And we didn't find any significant cost savings um, if an if a electric utility does it pretty standard, um, whether it's an electric utility or um, an incumbent local provider. So <clears throat> what we, we've created um, a subsidy based on town. So companies would propose to serve entire towns. We're starting with the assumption that um, each location passed would cost uh, a little over $4,000 a location. Um, for towns within a communication union district, we'd be proposing that they have decisional authority over those grants. So I provided you two maps. Uh, the first map um, is the map of what we would propose for a subsidy for each town. This is based purely on the number of locations that uh, are in the town uh, that are unserved at 25.3. So you can see some towns like Montpelier or Rutland will really have no funding available. Um, towns such as Victory, although 97% unserved, they have very few um, actual locations. So the subsidy appears low, but um, the whole town would need to be wired. So that would um, indicate- They may ask you to get to the, the best part of the state. I can't. Wait. Show him Bennington. Bennington. Oh, yes. I'm sorry, Senator. I, I apologize. I, apologize. <laughs> yeah, I know I I'm not the only one looking, Senator. Yeah. Sings, I could that, read her mind. I'm so That's sorry. Right. Yeah, I'm no, trying to not, see Wyndham. No, no need to apologize. Wyndham. There you go. Yeah, so um, as you would expect, um, you know, the, the towns between Ben and Brattleboro are the ones that would require the most subsidy. Um, the way we proposed the auction would work was th is, is that um, when when bids come in, we have to make sure that there's no town left behind. So we want to make sure that an entire county is served, or we could use regional planning commission boundaries. Um, as I said before, with CUDs, we would want to make sure the entire CUD is served. Great. So the way we want to treat CUDs is uh, either they would have decisional authority over the solution or they would get to bid on the money themselves. So if they want to provide the service themselves, they can bid just like everyone else. Um, if they're comfortable with a private uh, public partnership, um, they would have a hand in making the final determination as to what the solution is to their question. Matt, um, Matt Chair? Yes, Matt Pearson. Clay, um, we just looking at your map again, which is uh, everybody loves maps in this business. Thank you. Um, is the uh, red towns, are they a greater subsidy because 
they have fewer options today? In other words, they, they've got the, the least options or are, because because it seems like they would get the biggest bang for the buck. So I'm just trying to understand mm -hmm. a little bit, uh, you know, the, the, the places where we would spend the most per hookup would probably not be the places that have no options. Can you help me understand the, the legend, I guess? Yeah, so the, the legend, um, and, and it's a helpful question because um, we don't always know how our maps get viewed um, by the public and by the legislature. So um, the, the map is, is showing um, the, uh, it breaks down the amount of subsidies. So the red is 3 million to 5.7 million, um, and that is purely the result of the number of unserved locations. So maybe if I could zoom in to a, a, we'll pick Southern Vermont. Um, so you can see that Whitingham has 800 locations. Um, we also have a percentage uh, we're of locations. Losing it, so White, Whitingham, is the, oh, can you hear me? Now we have now. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So Whitingham is, a, is, is an example where the majority of the homes are unserved and there are a lot of unserved locations. Uh, now I'll pick on Victory, Vermont in the Northeast Kingdom uh, or any of these. Victory is 97% unserved, but it only has 101 unserved locations. And this is a weakness um, that we are trying to overcome by making sure the entire county um, has a solution. So um, the, if you purely did it based on town, um, the provider would be incentivized to serve Lunenburg and leave Victory behind. And we don't wanna see that. So that solution would have to include both Lunenburg and Victory. This is great, Clay. I really appreciate seeing this. Oh, thank you. Um, the second map I've provided you is just a map, an updated map of the CEDs. Every month we're getting um, new towns joining CD, so you can see where we are, uh, where we need to go uh, with CDs. So that is the central piece. Um, at this point, we're not identifying a funding source that's um, work that I think we're all going to need to do um, moving forward. Um, there are other recommendations long term. Um, concern over the access to middle mile fiber. We've been working with electric utilities on that issue because they have a lot of fiber. And so one recommendation we're going to make is to modify um, section uh, 8091 uh, to further provide open access of utility on middle mile fiber to entities like CEDs um, that could make use of it. Clay, could I ask one more question? Yeah. What well, um, this is this is really promising. Are are the CUDs? Are we in discussions with them at all um, to accelerate? I mean, everybody, every business wants to develop faster, and you know, now I would guess workforce can start to get back to work and actually do that. But is there? Is there some opportunity for us to help them build out faster? I mean, the need it, it has become more glaringly uh, obvious. And, and so I'm just curious if you've had any discussions along those lines. Yes, we we talk to CUDs almost daily. Um, the staff, uh, the, uh, you actually gave us through uh, Act 79, um, who's um, riding along with the CUDs on their journey. Um, there are a few areas where we are going to propose um, we could help CUDs. I've got two listed here. We'll have more in the plan that we develop. The, um, the first is um, continued grant support. Um, we provided uh, grant support for design and feasibility studies last year. Those are humming along. Those are going well. Um, what they're going to need moving forward is administrative support and grant writing support as they go to apply for some of that money, especially the money that Maria highlighted. Um, the second um, 
the FCC's Rural Digital Opportunity Fund um, is probably the biggest broadband expansion program um, that the federal government has right now. Um, it's going to mean somewhere in the neighborhood of $9 million a year for Vermont alone uh, over, over the 10 year period, um, excuse me, the 20 year period. Um, providing direct support to CDs to meet the letter of credit obligations is probably the most important thing we can do to make sure they can bid on that money. Um, Right now, CDs don't really have any money. They don't have any credibility that they can take to a bank um, and get a guarantee from a bank uh, to, to participate in the RDOF auction. So to the extent that the state could um, support CUDs by guaranteeing letters of credit, um, that would be an area of further exploration. And I know that that's discussion, that's the kind of discussion that's happening in other states. Okay. <clears throat> okay. You stop me if you have a question or Earl, if, Clay, uh, where where is this grant going to be submitted to? What's the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund? It is. Okay. Yeah. Um yeah, so for them to participate at the FCC in the auction um they have to be able to show that they're getting a letter they have a letter of credit for the full amount of the money uh, okay they propose to draw down uh, in that program that's the cuds and yeah that's that that's for anyone participating we've heard that incumbent providers are going to struggle with that uh, requirement and so cuds are going to be even more disadvantaged Okay. Um, and probably unable to participate. Maybe um, that's something we can talk to Vita about because we put some money in there last year as backstop, but maybe we could find a way. Okay. So you Any other questions also... for Clay? Uh, Madam Chair, if I could supplement something there. Yes. Uh, your question about Vita, for instance, is, is right on point, and you'll see in the May 5 draft that that's one of the things that we're thinking about, too, is that it would make sense to put more resources in there. So Senator Pearson's question about accelerating, one of the challenges with the CUDs is you have to keep in mind they're all citizens who have day jobs. And so it's, you know, it's a heavy lift for them. And I think the biggest help that we can give them at this point is funding for grant writing as Clay was pointing out, and technical assistance. And um, I had a third point, but it's escaped me right now. So I'll, I'll just uh, pass on. My point is that you'll see in the May 5 draft, many of these points uh, flushed out. It wasn't clear to me, Senator Cummings, whether you were asking about, when you said, where's the grant going to be submitted, whether you were asking about the RDOF auction, or were, if you were asking about No, I was else. asking, uh, this, this is a good plan. We're going to put this plan into a grant proposal. This, this is what I want to, I wanted to focus on. So as, as I said a moment ago, there, there is no one authority that I, I have seen yet that we, that we could put one grant in front of. But what we can design is this plan where we target a variety of funding pots and try to draw those dollars in. And if there is federal legislation that comes out, or better said, if at some point the federal delegation tells us another bill is being put together, we can get a, a big share of money. What would you do with that? This is the plan that we would yeah, use to ready. say, here's what we're going to do with it. Uh, for okay. instance, we, we had an ask like that not too long ago from Senator Leahy's office, and we had to very quickly within hours give him some ideas for, for what we would do with money if, uh, if, they, if he could get some in the next bill. And so this is a, a more coherent and a more... Um, yeah, I'm going to leave it at that, a more coherent uh, plan for that, that we've been working on for the past five weeks. As you can see, the maps, for instance, and the like, there was a lot yeah. of analysis that had to go into generating that. And this is the product that we, we have now, the final version will be to you on May 5. Okay. Sure. Okay, Clay, unless I hear uh, another question. I have, yours. I have a question. Uh, okay, Senator Sorokin. 
So I hope I'm not bringing the rest of the committee down to my level here, but I'm trying to understand the subsidies that were outlined. I seem to recall from uh, one of the pages that the total subsidy would be in any range of 89 million to 250 million. What does that range buy you? What does that subsidy buy you? Is that by universal broadband coverage up to 100 asymmetrical uh, for all those homes that don't have 25, three presently? Yeah, yes, at, at a high level, both with uh, do universal service fiber of the home in the places where we do not have um, 25 free today. The price difference comes down to, um, I'm sorry, I'm getting a message saying my internet connection is unstable. Yeah, your voice Probably is fading a little bit. Uh, uh, Gotta get you some broadband. All right, so the, 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 the way it comes, yeah. I, I live the problem every day, so um, don't think I lack um, uh, uh, a desire to do something about this problem. Um, it's, it comes down to the, the way um, we would propose funding that uh, 293 million would be straight grants at the full um, subsidy level. Um, but what we want to do is a reverse auction. So um, lower amounts of I mean, the, the bidders would be bidding on lower amounts of money for each town. Um, we've also are devising a scheme where there would be a mixture of grants and loans through um, a vehicle like Vita, um, where the some of the, the cash that they get are uh, lower, no interest loans and some of this money that would be needed would be used to build up a reserve fund um, for uh, for those loans. So on the on the maps where I saw like Whitingham, it had 2.5 million. Did it have a range, or was that the for that town somewhere in the middle between the 89 and 290 or something? Um, no, we, just for that town, the the full price of doing every home at $4,240 a location would cost 343, so uh, 3.43 million. So what we propose to do is just, you know, when we auction off Whitingham, um, you know, take the lowest bidder, so it might be less than that. Um, but then the, the difference in cost could also be reflected in how you, know, you pay the provider to do that. So whether it's a straight grant uh, oh, or if it's a mixture of grants and loans. So simplistically put, if if we were to ab able get this down to the lower end range of $89 million, we could take something like seven or 8% of our 1.25 billion and have broadband throughout the state. Yes, assuming you can get that money out the door um, within the time constraints, um, that is certainly uh, a possibility um, under okay. this scheme. It's, it's simply a matter of money um, and um, how you pay for it. Okay, Thank Commissioner, you. did I hear you? Yeah, I, I need to be very clear on this point. I think what Senator Sorokin is thinking is from a clinical perspective, absolutely correct. Um, from the perspective of the Scott administration, I hope the com committee will understand that I can't get out ahead of the governor in advocating what his administration thinks should happen with that money. But this is what a classic example of where the, the state really needs to come together and work together. And I know the governor wants to do that. And I think Senator Cummings, you know very well uh, the many ways in which that money is already being spent in, in people's heads. So I would just ask Senator Sorokin to keep that in mind. But, but what you said, Senator, is what my preferred solution would be if somebody gave me free reign with the money. And I just this, have to leave a placeholder for the governor here. And this is totally appropriate for one-time money. You 
you, you don't have to subsidize going forward, do you, in terms of the service? That's a separate question. Uh, we, um, we go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, we, we, we're not counting on that. Um, in, in, in part because that, that would be a question that would come later. I mean, so, some areas get a subsidy from the FCC, um, where, whereas other providers cover the same territory without a subsidy. So um, I, I think getting the service out there is one question, and then whether there needs to be an ongoing subsidy, um, I think that'd be very difficult for the state and um, would, should be incumbent on the FCC through the Universal Service Fund to provide a high cost subsidy like it's always done for telephone and, and now for broadband. Okay. okay. Thank you. Senator McDonald, you had a question? Uh, when Senator Sorotkin asked if everyone in the state could be served for $89 million, what was the level of service that was being delivered for that amount of money? We're proposing uh, fiber to the premises to all areas not served today at 25.3. So it's once you have fiber infrastructure capable of meeting the state's infrastructure 25.3. No. Of 25.3. No, I think no. I'm breaking up. No, not 25.3. Not no, it's people that have twenty five three like Montpelier, or better, are not eligible. Towns yeah, that don't have that, that have less than twenty five three or nothing, are the eligible towns. Am I understanding that correctly? Yes. We're so, focusing on sub on really substandard. So uh, if if Senator Sorotkin's question, the answer is yes for eighty nine million. We could get everyone 25, at least 25, three throughout the state. That's the, that's what you're telling us. No, that's what we're suggesting. It, we're, it's right here in a. Um, it would be we would propose infrastructure that meets the state's goal of 100, 100 megabits per second to all addresses currently unserved at 25, three. Okay, so. You're not it's more than it. 89 100, million. 100. It's it's un, more than 89 yeah. million to get to serve the state in a in right. A we're we're is, proposing uh, not to subsidize areas that already have decent broadband service. Right. Um, decent means what number? Twenty-five. 25 or better. Three. Okay. Well, I, then use the number. Don't use adjectives, please. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, Clay. Yeah. Did we just heard and I think the commissioner said this does not necessarily all have to come out of the one billion that the state just got that there are multiple um, grants or pots of money available that we could go after different different sections if We've already spoken for the one billion cares money three times over. So, um, Senator Cummings, if you don't mind, I'll take that question. That okay. that is that is correct. I think I, I think what we have to do is be thinking of it this way. Maybe there's some part of this that could be done through the CARES Act money or the COVID-19 money. Maybe there's some part of this that could be done through existing resources. But what we've tried to do right now is present you with an overview of what it's going to take to get everybody to 25-3 with fiber to the premises. And my hope is that there will be something in addition coming out of Washington, D.C. that would be some serious money that could be put toward this. It would be ideal if, if a comprehensive pot were forthcoming that could take care of this in one fell swoop. And this plan would certainly be instrumental in that. But barring that, funding is going to have to be something more piecemeal. Does that okay. help? That helps. Yeah, this is very helpful. Thank you. May I ask a question or two? Yes. Um, Mr. Brock. 
regarding the basis uh, for the cost estimates regarding the Magellan report, how comfortable would should we be that the Magellan report's costs are accurate? Wait. Uh, I, I do believe they're accurate. Um, I think they're probably on the high side. And the reason we're Uh, uh, there's a, uh, I apparently have authority to uh, allow people into the meeting. I hope oh, that's okay. <laughs> I can hear you. Um, I don't okay. know how you got authority. I don't know if I would do that, but. Um, Excuse me, this is Faith. It's fine. In order for him to screen share, he has to be a uh, caucus. And it that's is. That's right. Uh, okay. Graham, that's right. Graham well, can't well, just join the I meeting. I let somebody in, so. Um, <clears throat> But that's why we're proposing um, an auction um, because um, the cost may be high. Perhaps people can do it for less um, and companies would also then be encouraged to put some of their own equity into um, a project. Um, but okay. um, Participate. Averaging, yeah, oh, go ahead. Wait, excuse me. Averaging a single cost per passing for the whole state um, you know, is, is not an exact science. Um, sure. I'm happy to uh, share with you kind of the, the cost that went into it um, and, and the, the thought process there. Uh, but Magellan's done that kind of costing for uh, electric utilities and internet service providers um, in both the United States and Canada. How long so, ago was this done, Clay? We issued the report in December of 2019. Okay. Uh, so that work would have been done in the fall of 2019. So it's, okay, you know, so it's less than a year old. Now, in terms of the actual delivery uh, of uh, the fiber to the premises, uh, let's take a town that has 80% 20% 20% 20 unserved. Uh, would you anticipate the carrier or carriers that provided the 80% to be the carriers that would be involved in the auction? Or would you envision new participants becoming involved? Uh, I, I think that's where we run into a problem. Uh, the obvious answer would be to have the incumbent carrier that already provides 80% of that town do the last 20%. Um, but because our state goal mandates 100 uh, symmetrical service, um, unless cable companies can uh, promise to meet that, which they may, um, they would be foreclosed from uh, bidding on that uh, remaining 20%. So we would be looking for um, a fiber to the premises provider that could do the remaining 20%, and that would inevitably lead to competitive overbuilds of the remaining 80, um, which should be considered um, uh, in, in, in the costs that um, are attributed to that project. So that would that then suggest that for in that, that kind of case, that there would be a higher cost uh, for the remaining 20% because of the distances that that would have to that that would have to travel in order to get to the those premises. Yes, absolutely. Because we're we're not anticip we're not suggesting that we subsidize any locations already served um, at twenty five three. So um, under our scheme, if if a provider wanted to come in and do that twenty percent, they would have to put in a substantial amount of their own. Um, money to meet uh, the, the reserve price for that municipality. Are there any issues or, or restrictions about uh, uh, the potential of requiring a neutrality in terms of, 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 of the lines that go mm -hmm. in, in terms of their ability to serve a variety of, 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 of providers of content uh, on a, a lease basis? I think if it's, if it's our money, um, I think we can add the rules that we want regarding that. Um, in areas where you have CEDs, 
that I believe they've all made a commitment to net neutrality or intend to. Um, so uh, that's uh, certainly something worth thinking about um, as the program develops. Would that, serve to, would that serve to disencourage some of the larger providers from participating? I think if you put net neutrality restrictions on, um, on the program uh, that it may discourage, um, certainly the, um, the industry groups uh, that uh, brought a challenge uh, to the state's net neutrality law and participated in the, um, uh, the, the challenge that attorney generals um, put on the FCC's order um, are encouraging a national solution to net neutrality. So um, this would be an area where a state is acting um, on its own outside of a, a national that neutrality regime. Okay, that's that probably we just need to flag as an issue, um, because I know this it's currently in court and being decided, and our net neutrality bill has been put on hold. So I would think we'd have to conform with existing state law, which right now isn't set, it's, it's on hold, waiting court decisions. Well, I'm really just, just raising the issue of whether or not if we're paying for lines to go to the premises, uh, if we uh, are able to or should uh, require that those lines carry the content of any carrier mm -hmm. in order to get to those premises. Do you, do you mean uh, a, an edge provider, as in carry the content of Microsoft or Netflix, or do you mean um, an open access regime where uh, the lines are uh, can be used by multiple internet service providers uh, to provide the service in the home? The latter. The latter, okay. Um, no, that is um, th that is a question that we should incorporate into the plan. Um, we haven't intended to make a recommendation on that. Okay, so that's something to look to legal counsel. Just, but if at all possible, without violating federal law, I think the legislature is on record as supporting net neutrality, whether or not. That counts, I don't know, but um, I think the expectation would be that it would encompass net neutrality. Well, I think there actually might be some advantages even to larger carriers. If, for example, you have that 80 uh, 20 uh, town, the larger 80% carrier, if they were not the one to pay for that additional 10%, 20%, they might still benefit from having their content be able to be streamed to that remaining 20% mm -hmm. or for which they would pay a fee. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. I'm here. And, uh, Senator Pearson, I hear your Thank voice. You. Yeah, um, Clay, took a couple quick questions. Um, I, I join everybody in saying thank you. This is helpful and, and uh, feels concrete in the beginning of getting our arms around it. And I know a lot of work has gone into this. Let's say the administration was willing to make this investment. The legislature shared in the goal and we were able to find a hundred million dollars to get started. Is the department ready or would we need staff to help? I mean, I'm trying to, trying to understand uh, while we may be giddy at the prospect, what some of the other costs are gonna sneak up on us um, if we really try to dig into making this real? That's not a question I'm prepared to answer today. Um, I, I think we'd have to take stock of the, uh, the administrative tasks and costs associated with implementing a program like this. Um, the okay. departments and Department of 50 people, we have five in the telecom division. So 
um, it would be something that we'd have to review after I think the program design is more solidified. Okay, and and um, two more questions. Did, did the is your plan incorporate things like the connectivity fund and other existing plans or, or like, just yeah. talk a little bit about that. I assume it's layered on top, but I wonder if you could help us understand. Yes, we're in the interest of time, we, we would prefer that something like this get implemented through existing programs. So um, we have the connectivity initiative, which can do grants. Um, if some of the compensation to carriers were through a loan, VITA exists and can be helpful. Um, there are um, possibly the high, the high cost fund, um, which was created by um, state statute could be helpful here. So we'll, we will be laying that out. Um, it would require changes to those programs, but not a wholesale rewrite of, of, of them. Okay, thank you. Um, and and my last question, a um, couple of weeks ago, Maria walked us through some of uh, some data points that were pulled from you. You and I had some emails about her rough estimate, which I think was pulled from somewhere on you, of it being a billion dollars to get uh, fiber everywhere. Um, mm -hmm. This is, compared to that, radically more affordable. Is that because we're leaving people with 25.3 as is? Or can you just help me understand how we've, you know, either cut the, the cost by 90% or by 75%, depending on the range? Just help me understand that, please. Yeah, so we're, we're cutting out the 77% of buildings in the state that already have a 25.3 or better solution uh, in place. 17% um, of the state has fiber to the premises already. So, um, and then on top of that, 77% of the entire locations have uh, uh, cable uh, video service um, providing 25 feet or better. So we're proposing to exclude those from this program and focus on the people that really have nothing or very little in the way of bandwidth. Do we assume that, thank you, do we assume that this build out would go by a lot of those 25-3 locations and, and effectively bring them the ability to get a more robust service even though the cost isn't built that way? Right, um, it would likely entail competitive overbuilds of existing networks. What we don't want to do is fund that competitive overbuild. So um, to Senator Brock's point, where you have a town that's 80% served with cable video, um, there's going to have to be some amount of, of private capital that goes into building that because the subsidy for the 20% probably won't get you there. Um, so we're, we're anticipating that um, in those situations, yes, there will be, there would be some overbuild, um, but it would be privately funded. Okay. What Thank you, would, why would, why would someone privately fund that? Well, there's an incentive to get the public funding for the unserved locations. Um, cable okay. video is, um, generally deployed in areas that are uh, more competitive and the cost of service is lower. So village centers, uh, cities, um, suburban neighborhoods where um, carriers are likely more sure to have the take rate that they need to, to maintain the plant. Adam Chair? Yes. It's Senator Stand Ballot. <clears throat> I don't know if this is for Clay or for the commissioner. I was just wondering while we have you, if we could get an update on the um, broadband grant program. I know the first round of funding went out. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I thought another round was supposed to wrap up in February and then another in April. And of course that coincides with this uh, COVID-19 emergency. I'm just wondering if we could just get an update 
on the program and how much money is still in the funds. Okay, can we put that off for a second until I see if there's any more questions on the actual plan that Clay's presented? No, but just thanks, I know you thanks again. I really appreciate this. Okay, I have so a question. no more questions. Okay, Commissioner, we're back to you. I have a question. Uh, wait, Senator Sorokin. I did. I just unmuted myself. I'm sorry. So, following up on Senator Brock's question, it seems like that if there was some sort of softening, and I'm not saying that I would support that for the existing lines that you're running by that are at 25 three, you wouldn't have a disincentive for that company that's running that 25 three to provide a hundred asymmetrical further out. So we would be furthering our state goal for new people that would come on, but not making anybody who already had service at 25-3 making their service worse. It would stay the same. And it seems like it mm -hmm. would reduce the, the overall cost and subsidy if that requirement wasn't there. Am I missing something? Uh, no, I, I, uh, Senator, I think that's uh, correct. Um, we're, when in drafting this plan, we're relying on, or not relying, but uh, we've been reading other state uh, programs. Um, we're very familiar with the Massachusetts model. Um, we've looked at that many times. Uh, under that model, they did a town by town subsidy. They gave towns the decision authority to, uh, the decision authority to pick the solution they wanted. They could take the money reserved for them and do their own system or have, um, an incumbent provider provide the broadband. And um, they funded that program. They more or less have every town. I think only one town in Massachusetts is not completely served with broadband. The majority of the towns selected the incumbent cable provider um, because the, um, the, the cost uh, was less and the deployment timeline quicker. So there is an incredible build out of, of cable service in the the Western Massachusetts area, the Berkshires and Rainier Valley, um, mostly incumbent cable. And I think four towns or five towns uh, ended up building their own system uh, with the funding. So um, there, is a, there is a model for that and it's, it's in Massachusetts. Thank you. Okay, and we finished with questions. I can only see one at a time now. So I was just hearing none. I don't think we'll get to everything today. It might just be a good idea to talk about some of the short term. Short term actions, yeah. And then we'll get to the yeah. commissioner and that final question. Okay. Um, so these are short term proposals. Um, one, um, and I'll go through them very quickly, um, create a, um, a cable line extension fund that consumers could uh, individually request support from to do cable uh, line extensions. We're getting lots of calls from people that um, got a quote from a cable company on, to extend the line, but it's $1,000 or it's $2,000 to bring it to their house. Um, so this would be a fund that, um, that uh, consumers could apply for um, help just with the consumer portion of the line extension. Um, we have a rule on that at the state, uh, PUC rule eight, that um, has a formula for uh, divvying up costs for the consumer and the cable company. Uh, as I think June mentioned, we're reviewing um, past connectivity initiative proposals um, to see if there are any shovel ready projects that could be done this summer. Um, uh, language I think was submitted through the administration um, on uh, waiving Act 250 or Act 248A processes or letting the PUC do that on an emergency basis to approve um, quickly wireless facilities, um, something that uh, we'll propose in the plan. Uh, passing 248A, which I know this committee's already done, uh, so thank you. Um, uh, number five, I think if you wanna get in, uh, wire strung, 
our infrastructure in the ground before the end of the year, this is going to be an important one, is providing some kind of support to full looming utilities to fast track full licenses. Full licenses can take six months to a year um, uh, to be issued. Uh, they require survey work, make ready work, that would all have to be fast tracked. So um, another proposal that we'll put forward is um, uh, providing support to uh, companies to quickly ramp up um, their, their poll licensing um, uh, duties. They're usually um, staffed to handle, you know, somewhere between 100 and 300 miles of, of plant a year. But if there are projects in the hopper that could be done this summer, we'd like to see those get done. Um, and then the last is um, kind of standardizing or formalizing uh, a work group around federal grant. We've been in numerous conversations with um, state agencies, with nonprofits and the like, um, trying to uh, strategize how uh, someone could draw down this grant or that grant. Um, for instance, my staff gave a presentation to a telehealth um, work group. It's a group of uh, hospital and um, administrative staff and, and um, administrators uh, focused on telehealth. Um, we're working with um, groups on an individual basis to help them identify and um, apply for grants. Um, and so something that standardizes this or um, formalizes um, that effort um, would be helpful and something that we plan to propose. Okay. Any questions for Clay? All right. Thank you. This was very helpful. Well, thank you. I appreciate and, it. And a lot of work. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, and I think now maybe we'll start moving into filling in the details and perhaps help, helping to facilitate and reaching out to some of the telemedicine folks in the schools and see if we can get some priority areas. All right. Um, yeah, because is the plan to go out and bid all these at once or are you going to go out and bid a county at a time? Uh, I think uh, I think the timeline here is important uh, to maximize uh, participation. It would be most helpful to hold a state auction uh, around the same time as the art off auction, which is in late October. Um, so the turnaround there is quick, uh, but uh, it would be awkward, I think, if we had a scenario where say a satellite company took the RDOF census blocks um, and then we had um, a uh, fiber to the premises provider doing the rest. Um, I think there's, there would be some um, ability to leverage those RDOF dollars here if, if carriers could uh, apply for both at the same time. Okay. All right. Any other questions for Clay? If not, um, uh, Commissioner, we'll go to you and I think Sandra Ballant's question. Um, just very briefly, because I'm mindful of the time, um, the last answer that Clay just gave right now highlights the complexity of the interplay with federal programs and state programs. So ideally, we would be prepared to do one auction in the October timeframe. But we have to keep in mind that that may not be possible. If, for instance, if we haven't secured the requisite funding, we wouldn't be mm -hmm. in a position, I think, to hold that auction then. But these kinds of questions are things that I think we, we need to note and we need to be prepared to address while we keep momentum going forward. So the essential next step is to get this plan to you published for public comment, because you also have to keep in mind we need to socialize this with the stakeholders who are out there to hear from them, whether they think this is feasible or not, whether they would be willing to participate in this or not. So that is an essential next step. And then there's always the possibility to the point that uh, Senator Sorokin and Senator Brock was making, if, 
if the first approach doesn't work and say the town with the 80-20 split doesn't get a solution outright from the first round of auction, or because there are net neutrality uh, limitations imposed to the like, we can then go back and try again. Uh, the thing to do okay. is to is to pick up gains and make progress in the first instance. And then lastly, to Senator Pearson's point, I wanted to give him comfort that we, what Clay is telling you today is we don't know exactly what our staffing resource needs would be and the like, but please understand that much of what we've talked about today are things that the department is already doing, but putting it on steroids. So this is very much an overlay on the connectivity initiative that we've been administering pursuant to statute for a couple of years now. And it also is a deliberate attempt to incorporate the CUDs because the state policy since 2015 has been really to try to, to facilitate their participation in the build out of connectivity in Vermont. So those, those two um, poles of state policy enacted in law are very much at the foundation of what we're trying to do here. Where you see the rub is you have those pockets that don't make sense from an incumbent provider's perspective to serve, that's how you get an 80%, 20% split in a town, for instance. And that's really where the cut has a role because the, they're the people who are stepping up to say, okay, how can we organize ourselves to have a service vehicle, if you will, that will get to these people who have been left behind for too long. So I just wanted to bring those thoughts forward and to, to thank you for uh, the conversation that we've had today about this plan. And um, to again, just emphasize that we are open to um, suggestion and partnering on this because we have to get it right with the unified front as we look for funding. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. And committee, we've got one more thing. If, is Abby still available? I am looking. Abby, are you with us? I am, sorry. Let me you just... are, thank yeah. you. Okay. Madam Chair, if I could. Yes. I didn't get my question answered. Oh. Can I answer that? Commissioner. Uh, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question, Senator Ballant? Yes, it was about the uh, broadband. Yeah, the, funding, the, grants. the grants. I just yeah, wanted was... to know whether the two other, we're supposed to have one go out in February and April, and here we are in the pandemic. I just wanted to get yeah. a sense of what's happening with that. Yeah, Clay, if you wouldn't mind. Sure. Um, the the February one um, was the grant to uh, electric uh, distribution utilities, so we awarded that. Um, we're finalizing the contracts now. Um, we issued an RFP for the remainder of the broadband innovation grants. I believe that would be seven grants. We put um, an early and a late decision period in that RFP uh, because of the COVID emergency. So um, uh, grantees or uh, respondents could propose early if they wanted to. And we, I think we've gotten four um, just uh, the, the other day. And um, uh, there's another due date uh, at the end of May um, for anyone else who wants to apply. So um, that's still moving along um, very well. Great. Thanks for the update. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Abby, we had a couple questions for you, mostly on what kind of legal curtailments were on our ability to treat different classes of taxpayers differently, or perhaps different within one classification, mm -hmm. say non-residential, to treat in-state, out-of-state, or less than, or, you know, values less than or greater than. Senator McDonald, you're looking pained. Did you do have another? That was it? I think it was your question. Okay, you're muted. I love that. Um, Currently, great, we, so we, we are permitted to treat homeowners um, differently in how we tax their homesteads or the, the house and two acres where they live because that's a state, a legitimate state interest recognized by as being constitutional. To what extent do would, would we be able to have that same interest show up in our actions towards homeowners? Um, 
in this COVID, in COVID environment? Sure, so um, Abby Shepard, Office of Legislative Council, um, the way I framed your question was pretty broad and I laid out the definitions for homestead versus non-homestead. It's no longer non-residential. Um, to really make it clear the way that property uses are classified under Vermont law. Um, and I laid out different constitutional limits and protections that are placed on taxation and divvying up who's taxed and how and what rates are applied. So I have a fairly dense memo that I shared with Faith that should be posted. Um, I apologize, it took me to get yeah. out to you, but it is, there's a fair amount of case law um, and it's really, it's um, good news in a lot of ways for you because you do have a lot of latitude to determine how you wanna tax property um, owners. Um, really the, the hard limit that you have ha goes towards residency because of the US constitutional's prohibition against treating non-Vermonters differently um, and essentially discriminating against them in taxation um, compared to Vermont residents. The way that um, the state education property tax splits up taxpayers currently doesn't create any of those issues because non-homestead is not explicitly targeting non-residents. Non-residential is very broad. So it includes anyone that's not um, a prime, for which that property is not their principal dwelling. So any second residences, so those could be both Vermonters or out of state residents. It's also commercial. Um, and then there's also the whole category of exempt properties. I didn't get into that in this memo, um, but really those two, those two distinctions don't uh, bring up the constitutional issue of treating out of state uh, owners differently. The way that you could um, if the, I'm not sure if the proposal was to provide, the way I'd framed it in this memo was providing relief just to homestead. So just to um, property owners for whom their property is their principal dwelling, or potentially just, I think you'd mentioned possibly parceling out non-homestead owners. Um, that's where there might be some challenge, um, a constitutional challenge about it being, you know, you couldn't say it's only for Vermonters, for example. Um, but otherwise, there is quite broad latitude for the state to determine or legislature to determine how it would tax different property owners. Um, so the within that, you have both the Common Benefits Clause in the Vermont Constitution and the Proportional Contribution Clause. Um, and those, again, are pretty broad. You just have to show a rational basis. So rational basis requires a, a classification, so distinguishing between different taxpayers. There must be a reasonable relationship to the purpose of the tax. So the education property tax is providing um, substantial quality and access to education for all Vermont um, students. And the classification has to be fairly and, equ and equitably applied among like classes of taxpayers. So you, you have a fair amount of latitude there. Um, yeah, and I think, I think I'll stop there and there's a lot within my memo. And again, I apologize, I tried to make it as succinct as possible, but with as much uh, legal background as you needed. So I'm not sure that that answers your question though, Senator McDonald. So we can, Senator McDonald, you're muted. Okay. Should, now you're should the le Thank you, Madam Chair. Should the legislature in its wisdom choose to send a greater level of relief during this um, time of, of a pressure again on the uh, local education taxes. Um, it would be legally free to direct a disproportionate um, amount of money to um, resident homeowners who, whose primary, who living in their primary dwellings, as we do with the ability to pay your school taxes based on income, and not to other taxpayers. Now that would. It, it might not be a wise political idea, but it would be a, in, based on your research, a legal option that we might exercise. Correct. So I pointed out the property tax credit only is available to homestead property owners. So if you wanted to base your relief on a similar structure, there's already precedent for that. Um, 
not being a problem constitutionally. Right. Just up that rate at some point. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. And uh, committee, we've got a briefing on Thursday, uh, joint meeting with appropriations. Tom Cavett is going to give us a semi-official, uh, somewhat more detailed. He's been updating things every Monday uh, so that the money, our joint fiscal, uh, no, money chairs have gotten a briefing, but this is the first really complete revenue briefing, our forecast. We are, believe it or not, moving towards having to make decisions about budgets. Um, to that end, tomorrow I'm going to meet with Steve Klein and the treasurer just on the hunch we might not be able to cut or raise enough money to cover the 150, assuming everyone pays their taxes, the $250 million deficit we've been told we could have next year. So what I want to know is what we've been told borrowing is an option. And my, my question to them is, who do we borrow from? What does it cost? Um, so as we work through this, I, I at least want to know if it's possible and get some ideas before we, um, you know, start discussing it. Um, but know the, the parameters. So I thought I'd let you know I'm doing that. And then we'll have them in um, probably next week. Uh, we are running out of time uh, because we do need to, to get this moving. Uh, we do have the request from the towns that we do away with the requirement that they pay the property taxes in. I know the treasurer has suggested that we require them to pay it and that we, if we wanna do anything, subsidize their borrowing cost, which would be a lot cheaper than having to, and it would spread out the, the kind of the pain. So we're gonna be working through that. Um, I think Tom Cavett will have some other numbers, both for what we're looking at in the general and in the Ed Fund. Um, we haven't heard from the administration. They still are not prepared to come in, I guess, and talk about budget adjustment. Um, that's just not where their focus is up until this point. So we're going forward, joint fiscal is going forward. We passed yesterday the three buckets, tranches, whatever you wanna call them to put the uh, COVID relief fund money in. We've been very clear that if the administration doesn't think it's the right number in each bucket that to come back and tell us but they couldn't give us any hard numbers yesterday or even ranges. So we, we said, well, when you get your numbers finalized, tell us, to, you know, when you know what you've spent and what you're gonna charge FEMA for, let us know. And the goal is that for the bulk of the money that will go through the appropriations process. So things that are not an emergency. I assume broadband, if we're gonna look at that fund, we'd go in that, we'd go through the legislative appropriations process, probably an abbreviated form. Um, that's all I know right now. So, um, once we figure out how to cover our pay our bills. Um, we still haven't heard where the 27, $30 million that the schools are getting is going to go. 
Uh, we don't know if their budgets are going up, down. It sounds like on average, they're gonna be about the same. Uh, so that's where we are, Senator Pearson. Madam Chair, have we heard that the money directly to the schools, um, is that uh, something they invoice against? In other words, they say we had to buy 25 Chromebooks and, you know, 45 whatevers, or is that just a grant and maybe we could encourage them to help us soften next year? I think it's a grant, but uh, the most up-to-date information is what we got today from the secretary. I mean, I have most certainly been suggesting that as we work through uh, this whole process that those millions of dollars be figured into the final equation. If they've spent it, that's fine. If they haven't, then it's available and maybe the amount of money we need to send to some school districts would be down. Um, this isn't a time when anybody's going to be getting a windfall. The other thing I'm not sure of, and I'm thinking, you know, my county that has many state employees, most of whom have been working and being paid, I don't know how many people aren't going to be able to pay their property taxes. Some won't but some will, um, you know, the lower income range tends to be people who can't afford to own homes and rent. So I think that is a question that's still out there. We don't know, and it'll probably vary from town to town. Madam Chair? Yes. Um, I gotta jump off to go on this unemployment call um, yes, I think we all want to get there. Do you, do you have a copy of the joint fiscal letter that somebody could email me that you sent to Commissioner Harrington? Does Faith have it or do you have it? I don't. I think Teresa Utton sent it out. Yeah, Teresa would have it. Okay, thank you. If you drop her an email, Teresa will have it to you before I find it in okay. my email. I understand. Thank you. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye-bye. We'll see you there, yep. or at least hear you there. Okay. Committee, thank you. I think this was probably one of the more pleasant encounters we've had with the department. Maybe it was <laughs> worth all the, no, the effort, but um, I think this was probably the most pro progressive thing we've seen, so that was good. I think we're on a, on a good footing at this point. Well, I restrained myself today. I still have a lot of questions. Which I, I know. <laughs> and I appreciate yeah. it. We actually got something though that yeah. you know, we, we should mark the date. It was helpful. Yeah, we did get something and it, it is what we were asking for is that so, you know, now the devil is always in the details, but we at least have some broad strokes that we can start looking at. Okay, thank, thank you. you.